So looking at study guide number two, the first set of questions asks us to determine if the value that's given for X makes the equation a true statement. Does it balance out? Does this work out? Um, and so the, the best way to do that is we are going to replace the variable with its value. Now, if we look at it, I have X plus three, equals x squared minus 9 when x equals negative 2. Now, because the x is negative, especially when we have an exponent, it's really, really important that we are replacing the variable with parentheses to then plug that negative 2 in. So I kind of like to create a template where wherever I see an x, I just go through and I replace it with parentheses so that I'm handling the negative sign appropriately. So I plug in what X was worth and it was negative two. So when we start to solve this, it says we have a negative two and a positive three. My numbers are different, so I have to find the difference. I could also reorder this by just saying, I have a three minus a two. The difference between three and two is one. <coughs> then over here, because the negative two got replaced within parentheses, it means this exponent is on the negative and on the negative and on the two. So it's a negative two times a negative two. A negative times a negative makes it a positive and a two times a two turns it into four. So I have a one equaling four minus nine. Different signs, positive and negative, means I need to find the difference between my two numbers. Nine minus four is gonna be five, and then I asked, do I have more positives or more negatives? I had more negatives. So does one equal negative five? No, it doesn't work out. So we would say no, at one does not equal negative five. So as far as your explanation, your answer would be no, one doesn't equal negative five. When we put a slash through the equal sign, we're saying doesn't equal. And that's how we can solve that. So question number two gives us 16 minus X divided by 16 plus X. And does this solution equal one? Okay, when X is zero. When I plug in for X for or zero for X, that basically cancels them out. They hold no influence. So is this going to work out? Does zero work? I plug in a zero here and a zero here. The 16 over 16, a negative one. Anything divided by itself is a one, but a positive divided by a positive is a positive. So we can't divide two positive numbers and get a negative uh, quotient. So that is not a true statement. Now we're going to look at question 1c, and we need to find out, does this equation equal when x is 10? Now, you might be looking at this and say, ooh, I see a lot of similar terms. We've got look, some fours and negative five at the end. They look really similar. So you could go ahead and plug in x or plug in 10 for all of the x's. The other thing is you could also maybe do some simplifying to see what you actually have on each side. So this can't be simplified in any way, but over here, I can eliminate the parentheses by distributing the 4x by each of the terms inside. So if I have a 4x times an x, 4 times a 1 is a 4, x times an x is x squared, because anytime we have repeated multiplication, we use exponents to simplify it. Then if I have a 4x and negative one times, four times a negative one is a negative four, and there's an x on that, and then I just bring down the five. Well, if we look at that, they're equivalent. So that means it doesn't matter what x is, both sides are always going to be equal because they simplify to the exact same expression. So your answer could be yes, 
4x squared minus 4x minus 5 equals 4x squared minus 4x minus 5. All numbers are going to work. So if you weren't sure about that method, we could also plug in the 10 for x. So wherever we have an x, like I said earlier, let's replace it with parentheses. So I'm going to go 4 parentheses squared minus 4 parentheses minus 5 equals 4 parentheses times, we'll make that a little bit bigger so I can distinguish it, x minus 1, big parentheses, minus 5. Now, everywhere I had the little parentheses for the X, I'm going to plug in a 10. So 10, 10, 10, and 10. And now I can start solving using the order of operations. I'm going to clear out uh, the exponent. 10 squared means 10 times 10, which is 100. So 4 times 100 gives me 400. Then I have... Um, I'm just going to go ahead and solve order of operations on this side first. Negative 4 times a positive 10 is going to give me a negative 40. And then I just have a negative 5. So then I go over here. I'm going to solve what's in parentheses first. 10 minus 9, or sorry, 10 minus 1 is 9. And 9 is then getting multiplied by the value of 4 times 10. 4 times 10 is 40. So 40 is supposed to multiply by 9 and then subtract 5. So let's simplify over here. I have a 40, 400, and I take away 40, which leaves me with 360. Then I take another way, another 5, it leaves me with 355. I could have also combined, if I have a negative 40 and a negative 5, it means I have a negative 45 that I'd be taking away from 400 and still get down to the 355. Then I go over here, 4 times 9 is going to be 36. And then since that was a 40, I just tag a 0 on. And then 360 minus 5, I get a 355. Well, 355 equals 355. So yes, X is the solution because 355 equals 355. So question two asks us to write a story problem about the perimeter of a rectangle. We should know that the perimeter of a rectangle is the outside dimensions. And the formula for perimeter is twice the length plus twice the width. I see this value repeating and this value repeating. The parentheses are there only as an organizational tool to say this is a set of values that represents one dimension, and we have that twice. So, and we know that the total perimeter is 50. So you make up anything that is rectangular in shape and could be 50 of some units. Um, I'm going to... Say um, I'm building an outside fence for my dog with a perimeter of 50, okay? Uh, the outside fence for my dog is 50 feet, okay? And what are each one of these representing? Length and perimeter is the longest side. Well, this is some value plus five, and this is some value, this is going to, x is going to be our width, and x plus five is going to be our length. So we would say the length is five more than the width. So that would account for x, the width being some unknown value and the length being five more than, which expresses addition, than whatever that width is. And then I have that, a total of four different sides, okay? So then whenever you have a story problem, this would be stating what's going on, but this doesn't give me a problem to solve. So we would then wanna add, what is the width and length of the, the fence? What is the width and length of the fence. And so by posing a question at the end, we're giving somebody a problem to solve. You don't actually need to solve it. You don't need to tell me what the width and length are worth. We're just setting up a story problem. 
So question four gives us a couple of different story problems and we need to find the equation that is accurately representing what's going on in that story problem and explaining what each one of the values are worth. Um, matching the equation, telling what each number means in the context of the story, saying, describing what the variable stands for, and then actually stating what the solution is. So if our first one is saying, you deposit money in the bank, you withdraw the same amount every month. Which one is saying, I have put money into an, an account? So it's here. And then each month, a fixed set amount is being taken from it for an unknown amount of time. And then that's gonna then equal what's left in my account, right? So would the first, second, or third equation be modeling that situation? The third one, you bet. So let's start. So we'll answer that for number one. We have 1,500 minus 1,200, or too many zeros, 120x equals 600. So we want to describe what each of these values then is represented. What does 1,500 mean? or 1,500 is the, starts off, you deposited money in an account. So this would be saying your starting balance, okay? Or the amount deposited. Then if we look at the next one, it's a negative 120. What was happening to that account? The amount taken out each month, okay? So negative 120 is the amount taken out each month. And again, you don't want to just say 120 the amount taken out because that would be saying you're only doing it once. This variable is saying that this is occurring repeatedly an unknown number of times. And then we have 600 as the balance after X months, or we can just say the remaining balance, okay? So then what is X? Well, X represents months. So now we have to go ahead and solve this. So if we set this up, we have our original equation and our goal is to isolate X. We gotta solve for X. So that means we leave the X term alone. We deal with it last. So what is in the way of the X term being all alone on this side of the equal sign? The 1500. Because I have 1500, I have to then do the opposite of that to get rid of it. So I'm gonna take away 1500 from both sides, leaving me with negative 120 X equaling well, I have a positive and I have a negative. So that means I have to find the difference between 1,500 and 600. So if I just knock off those zeros, what is 15 minus six? I think that's nine, okay? So we have a negative. So we have a 900 for the difference. And I have more negatives than positives. So then, my last step is now to take the number off of the X so that it is by, it is by itself. So um, I'm gonna divide by negative 120, divide by negative 120. And this is good because I need a negative divided by a negative so it turns into a positive answer. I can't have a negative amount of time because that would say in the past. No, we have to have time for graphs. So if I take 900 and I divide it by 120, 900 divided by 120, I. What did I do? Seven and a half months? Crap. I'm going to pause this for a second. All right. And if you might be a little confused as to why this would work out to a decimal, it's because I wrote the problem wrong. Uh, to air is human and. Of course, I have to get this on recording. It was not 600, it was 660. 660, so that when I take and find the difference between 1500 and 660, I get negative 840, which is then divisible by 120, and that would be a seven. 
So X equals seven. So seven months is the amount of time it took. When things don't work out right, or like, hmm, why? I'm not going to take money out halfway through the month. I need the whole month. Go back and double check your answers or double check your equation. Okay, option B, I took out the one equation because we'd already used it up. We're not going to repeat it. The next one says a store is having a sale on car stereos. First, a certain percentage is taken off the price. Then the price is reduced by a fixed, uh, by a number of fixed dollars. And I realized I wrote this one wrong again as well. I'd love to buy a stereo that was only $16. No, it's $116. Okay. So which one of these would accurately express that? Well, I kind of gave it away by being like, oh, I want a $16 stereo, but no, I got to pay that. This also doesn't really have any context. Whenever we see a decimal attached to a variable, this should like turn on the light bulb in our heads to say, oh, this is a percentage of some original price, some original amount. So decimals being multiplied by something else relate to percentages. And it said that we have a, per a percent discount on our stereo. So if it's saying 0.9 of X, that's saying 90% remained of that original price for what we're paying. So it's showing a 10% discount, okay? Um, so it's one, two, three, four. So we state our equation, what each represents. So um, the so the percent, so point nine is representing the percent you pay after discount. Okay, and then it gives us a negative 10. Well, in the story, it said that there was also just a fixed amount taken off. Okay, uh, the price is reduced by a fixed number of dollars. Okay, so negative 10 represents the additional discount in dollars. And then what does 116 represent? We've had all these discounts. This is what you have at the end. So this is the final sale price. Okay. Then it asks us to identify what is X? Well, any variable multiplied by some percent is saying the percent of this and what we're talking about, what we don't know is the original price of the stereo. So X equals, X is the original cost of the stereo, okay? So then finally, well, we gotta figure out what that price is. So we we'll need to start solving 0.9x minus 10 equals 116. So our goal is to get the x term by itself, but we worry about the number on the x last. We deal with anything else on that same side first. So if I took $10 off to get to the sale price, it means I add, need to add 10 back to it to start working back to what that original cost was. So this gives me 0.9x equals 126. Now I have nothing else to do but take the 0.9 off of the X because it's originally showing a multiplication. I need to divide off of both sides by 0 0.9, 0 0.9. And when I do that, I get my calculator. I think I already know what the price is just because I've done this a few times, but it's good to verify. Yep, 140. So that cancels out leaving me with X and X equals 140. Okay, so there's the cost of our original stereo, which then through the process of elimination lets us know that this equation represents the last story problem. And hopefully it makes sense. Otherwise we messed up somewhere, which as I've proven happens to the best of us. Okay, uh, so it says your family is installing carpet. The cost include the the costs include the cost of the carpet per square yard, 
and the cost of the padding per square yard plus a fixed installation fee. So I'm just going to be lazy and write that this is answer one. Answer two is asking us to identify what each of our numbers is worth. Okay, so we have the cost of the carpet per square yard, the cost of the pad per square yard, and a fixed installation fee. Do we know how big the living room is? No, or whatever room this is getting installed. No, it's an unknown amount, but our carpet's more expensive than just the pad underneath. So we'll say 14 is cost per square yard, I believe square yard, okay, of carpet. Three is cost per square yard of padding. 150 is the installation fee. And all of this then combines, I know I'm writing a little sloppy, sorry, total cost of carpet, to get that carpet put in, bought and put in. Okay, so then the next one is, well, what is X? Well, we know how we have all of these fees per square yard, but what we don't know is how many square yards we have. So X equals number of square yards. Okay, that means it's time to solve. I have 14 of something plus three of something plus 150 equaling 1102. We want to, I see I have an X here and an X here. I need to combine like terms to find out how many X's I have all together. If I pay $14 per square yard and $3 for the padding, it means each square yard I need to purchase is costing me a total, or each square yard that I have is costing me $17. And then I have the installation fee for my total expenses. Well, I need to take out the installation fee to find out how much I spent just on the, the, the carpeting and padding. So I take away 150, take away 150, and then I'm going to have 17x equals, and just because I want to be fast, I'm going to go 1102 minus 150 equals 952. And then to get the x alone to find the square yardage, I divide that 952 by 17, which is going to give me our total square yards is 56 square yards. When in doubt, it never hurts to label what your variable is representing. Question five gives us four different equations that we need to determine, is there even a solution to this? Sometimes by just looking at the rules of math or rewriting these equations, we can determine that psh, I don't even need to waste my time trying to solve this because there's no solution that can make this true. Or, oh, look at that. It doesn't matter what X is. It's always going to be true. Both sides are always going to be representing the exact same value. Or, hey, this does work out sometimes if X is a certain value, and then that means you need to find what that solution is. So looking at this first one, sometimes we don't even have to do any solving calculations. And saying, I have five, and I'm supposed to take away twice the value two times, or yeah, no, uh, twice the value, I'm saying that wrong. The value of something times itself, and then I'm supposed to get a bigger answer. Now our brains might think, ooh, if I have a one squared, which is one, five and one is six. But the issue is this is not a part of the parentheses. This is getting, subtracting whatever the square of something is. The square of any number is a positive answer. Doesn't matter what this X is, it's getting multiplied by itself. So if it was a negative, the negative times negative turns positive. So five can't take a number away from it and create a bigger answer. So we say no solution, squared values are always positive and you can't subtract a positive away and make it bigger. Okay, uh, that's kind of a, you won't be asked to articulate something quite that complex. You just be like, is there a solution or not? For this one, we'll just say 
The answer is no, can't make it bigger. Can't make a five bigger than it is when you take away something from it, okay? Here we have a one and a half y plus five and does it equal y plus 10 divided by two? Well, it's kind of hard to see when this isn't simplified. So let's find out, well, what is this worth? How would I rewrite this? This two is dividing by both of the terms. Well, if I have a y divided by two, that means I need half of y's value, which then is expressed is this. We do not put the y in our division problem. We express its worth as multiplying by the reciprocal, basically, um, turning that into a fraction and multiplying it by y is the same as that. We don't keep the variable in the division problem or the division term. And then, so if I have 10 divided by two, 10 divided by two is five. Whoa, look at that. So you can say, yes, always true. They're equivalent. They are the exact same equation or expression. Um, so yeah, it's always gonna work out. So we'd say always for this. It doesn't matter what x is. Then if we look at this, I have 3x plus 7 equaling 3 times the sum of x and 1. Well, I can't tell for sure whether this is going to work out if it's currently in this form. I need to simplify this and see what it says. 3 times x is going to be 3x, and a 3 times a 1 equals a 3. Well, I notice that they have the exact same variable term. So whatever I make x on one, I'm making x the same on the other, and these are always going to be worth the exact same amount, which means they really hold no influence into what our final answer is. So if I ignore them, I'm left with seven on one side of the equal sign and a three on the other, and these are never going to balance out. So there is no solution because seven is never going to equal a three when our variables are the same and they don't ever cause us to keep, make the sides change and equal each other. So <clears throat> it's all good. Um, and then here, is there some number we can multiply by five, take one away and have a nine? Seems reasonable to me, but let's verify that mathematically. If I have a negative one, to get rid of it, I add one to each side. That cancels out, leaving me with 5x equals 10. And when I divide 5 off, I get x equals 2. So this would be sometimes when x equals 2. Now, one of the things to be aware of is always thinking about also the possibility of 0 being an answer, OK? because you might have something that looks like, because sometimes you can't have two things that'll make it right. And sometimes that answer can be a zero or a one, okay? So if I had a two X plus seven equals seven, you might think, ooh, ooh, well this side's always going to be twice as big of the X. It's always gonna be bigger because of this. Well, what if that went away? What if we didn't have that? What would x be that would make this disappear? x being zero. So this can become true when x is zero because two times zero is zero, that goes away and seven always equals seven. So be aware of that. Can it equal if x gets kicked out and x can get kicked out when you make it be a zero? So 6a gives us a story problem where we need to generate an equation and then find the solution to that equation. So it was saying that Amy went and decided to go get some, some organizers and found out that they were having a 30% discount on organizers. So after the discount, ignoring sales tax, the price was $59.36 is what she paid. One of the things we need to be paying attention to when we are given equations or when we are given percentages is sometimes the percentage they give us is not the percentage we care about. This is the discount percentage. Is this price the price that we saved? No, this is the price we paid. That percent does not represent the, the amount we paid. We then paid, if we didn't pay 30% of 100%, it meant we paid 70%.
So this expresses 70% of that original cost. We don't need this. We just needed that to find this. So then we go back to figuring out what are the rules when we're working with percentages. One, we always convert them to their decimal equivalent. So that means if I have 70 as a whole number, I move the decimal forward two places and I now have 0.7 or 0 0.70. It doesn't matter. Um, point, we'll go ahead and do 0 0.70 because I'm going to need two decimal places for the change. So we'll go ahead and just keep two decimal places in our problem. The second thing that always applies to percentages is they have to be multiplied by some larger value to have meaning. Otherwise, you're just saying no matter what the price was, you're paying, you're getting 70 cents. You're dealing with 70 cents. Well, no, it's 70 cents of every dollar that the original value costs. So it always has to be multiplied by some other value. Well, in this case, we're talking about, well, what was the original price? We don't know, so we use an X. So 0.70 X. So 70% of our original price gave us the final sale price of $59.36. Now that we have that, we can go ahead and figure out well, what was X originally. Because I have 0 0.70 times X, it means I need to divide by 0 0.70 off of both sides, leaving me with X. And it, in the calculator is 84.8. Well, the context is money. So I need to write this as money, which means I have a dollar sign and I need a zero, two decimal place values to account for the change. So the original price is 84.80. Then I could double check that. Well, what is 30% of that? If I didn't have to pay that, I go 84, 84. 0.8 times 0.3. Oh, thought I was in my calculator. 84.8 times 0.3. It meant I got my 30% discount. So it meant I saved $25.44. Okay. $25.44 was taken off at the register. So when I go 84.8 and I take out my Discount price, guess what? I'm left at $59.36. So I know that that is the correct calculation. So be careful about the percent you use based on the context of the story. 6B gave us a story problem where Lupita's parents set up a bank account for her dorm room and Lupita's parents deposited $5,650 into her account and $550 was deducted each month. And how long did it take to reach a balance of $700? So we need to model that. What was our starting point? What was the money put in the bank account? How much was that? $56.50. Okay, then what happened to that account each month? $550 was taken out. So month one, $550 was taken out. Month two, $550 was taken out. Month three, $550 was taken out. So there's this repeated deduction, but we don't know how many times it was taken out. So we have to put 550 or negative 550x to say when we figure out how many months it is, we multiply it by negative 550 because that's how many times we took that amount out. And then we didn't want to reach zero. We said that the final balance was 700. Okay, so this is our equation. This is where we started. This is where we end. This is what happened. What does this have to be to make this all work out? So we got to isolate the X term. What's in the way of this X term being by itself? The 5650. So we take away 5650. Take away 5650. And when we do that, 550x five, five, equals 4950. Yes, I worked this out ahead of time so it went a little smoother. Okay. But then, so that was the difference between these two values. But I had more negatives than positives. So this is a negative 4950. Again, we need that so that we have a negative divided by a negative to make a positive amount for the time because we're no Marty McFly going back, going back to the future type of, yeah, whatever. Uh, I just aged myself. We're gonna move on. All right, so now my last step is to take away the negative 550 from the X or get it off of there. I have to do the opposite operation, which is division, negative 550 
there. I'm left with X on the left and nine on the right. So it takes nine months to start here and with a balance of 700 when $550 is deducted from the account each month. Plus nine months makes sense because how long is the general school term? Three quarters, which is nine months. So, yay. 6C was very similar to the new shoes task that we had. And that's saying you go to the store and you see this $20, in this case, it was $20 off a purchase of $50 or more. And then you get to the store and you see, ooh, it's 15% off of $20 or anything $50 or more. And you go to the register and you see that they are the same. Whenever they're the same, it means they're equal. So you need to set this up as an equation where one value is equal to the other. So it says a fixed discount of $20 off. What's equivalent to that $20 off? 15% off of whatever the cost was. Well, again, we use our rules with percentages. We convert the percent to its decimal equivalent. 15% turns into 0.15 and 0.5 what? If I leave it like this, I'm just saying I get 15 cents off. $20 off and 15 cents off are not the same, but 15% of whatever the original cost is, is supposed to be equal to that. So percentages converted to decimal, attach it to a variable because it has to multiply by something to have meaning. Last step is, well, now I need to get the 0.15 off of the X, so I need to divide it off of both sides. That leaves me with an X equaling 133.3333. Well, guess what? This is money, so I guess you can't see that. This is money. So all of these extra threes hold no value. We would need to round to the nearest whole penny, which is this spot. Since this three after that is less than five, that three gets to stay a three. So our final answer is the original price is $133.33. Problem number seven gives us three different equations that we need to write to solve for a different variable. This is a really important skill because when we go into linear functions, we need to know how to rewrite equations to be able to solve for y. And sometimes those equations aren't set up that way already, so we know, need to know how to move things around. Looking at A, we see a cardinal rule being broken, and that is you have a variable in two different places. You cannot have that in your final answer. So if we have a P here and a second P here, I need to add the two together. If I have a P numerically, that's represented with a one. You can write a one if you need that visual. So if I have one and I have 0 0.08 of one, it means I have a dollar, I have eight cents, it has, means I have a dollar eight cents, but uh, 108, 1.08 P equals the amount. Well, it didn't want me to just simplify P, it wanted me to solve for P. So, how do I get P by itself? What's in the way of that? A multiple multiplying by 1.08. So, that means I need to divide by 1.08 on each side. And that leaves me with the final equation, P equals the amount divided by 1.08. That is your final solution, where you have one P variable isolated and its expression in terms of the other values. Here, we now need to solve for H. We need H by itself. What's in the way of that being by itself? The multiplying of pi and R squared. Well, I want to get that whole thing off of there. And since it's all multiplying originally, I need to divide it to make it go above by. So pi r squared, pi r squared. This lets me have h alone, h. And what does it equal? It equals v over pi r squared. This is the formula for volume. Volume is calculated by pi r squared h. So we could find the height of something if we take the volume and divide it by pi r squared. It's a little, don't need to know that. It was just kind of a little, little bit of trivia. But this is the rewriting of it. So there we go. Now, finally, we need to solve for y, this guy. 
we deal with the Y term last. Get rid of everything else on that same side. I have a positive 2X. I need it to go away. So that means I'm going to subtract it. I'm not wanting to divide 2 off of the X because I don't want it separated. I just want the whole thing to move. So that's why it's a subtraction. I would only divide if I was trying to get the 2 off of the X. Oh, no. So minus it from both sides. The G was there first. So it goes first and I take away the two X, leaving me with seven Y. Now, the last thing to do to get Y by itself is divide that seven off of there. So when I divide by seven, divide by seven, I get the final equation is Y equals G minus two X over seven. Question eight asks us to generate inequality statements so that we can compare two values. In this story problem, 8a, it's saying the dog weighs at least 45 pounds. So we don't know how much the dog is. And it gives us a reference point of 45. We have to choose which inequality statement is going to fit for this. On the test, this will be presented as a multiple choice. So you don't have to worry about trying to find what the where the correct inequality sign is. It's going to be there. You just choose the one that's correctly expressing the situation. So this says the dog weighs at least 45 pounds. So is that saying that that is the maximum the dog can weigh or the minimum that it's going to could be greater than this? Or is it saying it's going to be less than this? Well, at least is giving me a minimum value. So that's saying that 45 is the smaller value, that the weight could be more than, greater than 45, but saying the at least is also indicating it could include 45. The dog could be 45, or it can be anything greater than that. So the little line under, under our inequality statement is saying greater than or equal to, which lets us include that or say anything greater than that. Here, it's saying the class could see no more than 28 people. Do we know how many students we have? No, but it gives us a reference point of 28. So is this 28 people the maximum, the most number of students, or the minimum, the fewest we could possibly have? We have to have anything greater than that. Well, it's saying the class could have no more than 28. So 28 is the highest value. But can the number of students in the classroom also be 28? Well, yeah, because it can't hold more than 28, but it could hold 28. So X is less than or equal to 28. So is anything less or equivalent to the value of 28? Question nine gives us three different equations where we actually need to find out what the solution is. If we look at A, it's saying two divided by X's value gives us 10. So say I have two whole of something and I take X out of it enough times to have 10 pieces. Well, that kind of gives me a hint that X has to be really small in order to have 10 pieces when I break two up. So the way we solve this is currently I have a divide by something, which means I have to multiply by it on both sides. That cancels out on the left, leaving you with two equals 10 X, because it was 10 times the X. Now our goal is, well, we gotta get X by itself, which means now, this is a little confusing because you move X over here and then you have to move something back over, uh, but this is the way it works out. So if I have a 10 multiplying by X, I have to divide 10 off of both sides to get X alone. Well, X is supposed to equal two tenths. Two tenths is divisible by a common factor of two. Two divided by two turns into one. 10 divided by two equals five, okay? So X is one fifth. X equals one fifth. Now we could double check that by going, oh, if I plug that in, two divided by one, half, uh, one fifth, means I copy, I dot, and I flip. So two times five is 10. One times one is one. 10 over one turns into 10. So that's correct. This would be saying I'm breaking a whole up into pieces that are one fifth each. Each 
each hole would have five pieces. And if you have that twice, you have 10. So it's all just confirming that yes, our math was correct, even though it looks kind of like a wonky process. Here we have uh, negative 3 fourths times x equals 15 because three quarters is supposed to be multiplying by X, it means I have to divide it off of both sides. Um, I know that in doing that, it's gonna let me have X by itself. And if I have 15 divided by negative three fourths, it means I have 15 times copy dot flip. I multiply it by the reciprocal of negative three fourths, which is negative four thirds. Then I set it up as a fraction. I can cross cancel. 15 and three are both divisible by three. 15 divided by three turns into five. Three divided by three turns into one. Now both of my fractions are over one, meaning my numerators are actually whole numbers. So if I have a five times a negative four, that is gonna give me a negative 20 or x. I can also plug that in to verify if I have negative 3 fourths times negative 20, I'll need to make it over 1. Uh, I could cross cancel or I can multiply straight across. Um, I like to cross cancel. So uh, 4 can divide out of 4 and out of 20. So this turns into 1. 20 turns into 5. A negative 3 times a negative 5 a positive 15, which was our original value. So that's correct. Then when we go to this last problem here, C, it's saying I have X plus X divided by five equals 12. Well, I mentioned earlier that we never have X involved in division. We have it multiplying by the reciprocal. What's the opposite? of a five or what's the reciprocal of a five? It's one fifth. So I'm gonna have an X plus a one fifth of X multiplying, uh, or just the shortcut is put the X over on the side, tack a one in where it was. It's basically having us do the same thing, equals 12. I have an X here, but I also have an X here. I can't have it in two places and be able to solve for it. So I need to combine my terms. If I have an X here, numerically, that means I have a one. If I add one and one fifth, I get one and one fifth X equaling 12. I can't multiply by a mixed number, which means I also then can't divide by a mixed number. So this sucker has to get converted to an improper fraction. And we just say it takes five pieces to make a whole. I have enough to do that one time, which means I have five pieces. Then I have one extra additional piece, meaning I have six out of five pieces times X equaling 12. Now I need to divide six fifths off of each set, which the shortcut is just I X equals copy dot, and instead of dividing by six fifths, I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of five sixths. I just take that, I flip it, and then instead of dividing, I'm multiplying. And then just because I like cross canceling, it lets me keep my numbers smaller, I'm gonna go, well, 12 and six can both divide by six. That lets me turn the six into a one. This 12 turns into a two. Two times five, equals 10. One, one times one means it's one on the bottom, which just means it's a whole number. If you didn't cross cancel, you could have just gone 12 times five to get 60. And 60 divided by six also gets you 10. So X is 10. And it never hurts to just double check that. So if X is supposed to be 10, that means I have 10 here plus 10 divided by five equaling 12. Well, 10 divided by five is two. If I have 10 plus two, it equals 12. So yes, X equals 10 for the solution to this equation. test. Okay, question 10, our last question. There is a question like this on the test, different context, but still the same idea of an inequality, setting up a, an equation that models what's going on and being able to solve for the unknown. So it says, uh, Monica has a budget of $2,000 to spend on a bathroom remodel. 
Bathroom fixtures will cost $1,200 and she hires a handyman for $45 an hour. How many hours can he work without exceeding the budget? So we need to think, what's her, how much does she have to spend? She has 2,000. Now, does this amount have to equal 2,000? No, it can be less than it. This is just our, the ceiling that we have. So we're gonna set this up as an inequality. Say whatever her expenses are, are less than or equal to 2,000, but they can't be over 2,000. And what is a part of her expenses? Well, she had a fixed expense of buying the features in the bathroom themselves, and then the, the, the person to actually do the installation, do the work. So we have the cost of the, fi the features, the fixtures, plus the cost of the laborer, but is it only $45? No, it's $45 for every hour they work. Do we know how many hours they work? No, that's what we're trying to figure out right now. So this is our inequality statement. This is step A to the story problem. Now we need to find out what, what, is, gonna X, what is X going to be to make keep this true. So we need to take off the amount spent on fixtures to find out how much money we have for labor. So we take the 1200 away and that leaves us with $800. So they have up to $800 to spend on the laborer. Well, when we divide how much it costs per hour, then we're able to find out that X is less than or equal to, and let me get on my hand and down the calculator, 800 divided by 45. That gives me 17.777. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't know of any handyman who charges seven tenths of an hour for their work. It doesn't work. So our option, they're only doing it in whole hours. So generally we're used to saying, oh, this, this rounds up. If I had 18, if that laborer, if that person worked for 18 hours, that would be more than my budget lets me spend. It's too much. It would put me over budget. So we have to then just cut it off at the nearest whole hour or to the, to the whole hour and cut off any extra time. So X is less than or equal to 17. So that person can work for 17 hours or anything less than that. And that would let you stay in budget. So that would be as well as 17 hours. So you wouldn't want to give me 17.77 hours because that doesn't fit in the context of the story. So give me something that does and good luck.